Good morning. Hello. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to our weekly daily natural news live show. Today, we're going to talk about COVID news, but specifically a study that came out by the folks over at the Pew Study Research Group. And they've analyzed stress and decision fatigue surrounding COVID. And we're going to talk about that because I think we're all kind of feeling the strain of weighing options, healthy, maybe not so healthy, risks, mitigating risks. And so I want to talk about some natural resources, particularly homeopathy, how you can utilize that to help support your body and manage the mental strain, stress, anxiety, brain fatigue, brain fog, all those um, elements uh, specific to uh, COVID. So we're going to talk about that. And I just want to make sure Instagram is connecting they are buffering a little bit. So welcome to all of you joining on our news live show. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the latest news. And, and we also are going to talk about um, specifically updates to what's happening worldwide and here in the U.S. Um, regarding COVID. So buckle up. If you guys haven't joined me in a little while, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of news. Um, and then we will talk about how to manage the psychological stress that all of us are under. And if you don't think you're under psychological stress, uh, you might be in a little bit of denial because <laughs> we all are. So comment down below if you feel like this show is going to be very helpful for you if you are in a stress. This also includes any of you feeling anxiety, uh, you know, brain fatigue, mentally, physically exhausted, depressed, and um, just not 100% yourself and feeling like maybe even you're stuck. Um, so very, very common. And I want to validate each and every one of you who feels that way. So let's dig into our news worldwide. Um, we hit 25 million cases. Uh, I believe it was yesterday, sometime during the middle part of the day. The US is at 6 uh, million cases. We had a bad day yesterday in terms of fatalities. We um, are, had over 70,000 fatalities um, actually, I'm sorry, no, not fatalities. We had positive cases. We had 72,000 positive new cases, which is, is up quite a bit from some of the decreases we saw in the last two weeks. Um, but we did have fatalities, over 1,500 um, lives lost yesterday due to COVID. And we are now over 185,000 uh, fatalities here in the U.S., um, internationally, I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on. Four countries have seen an increase, potentially maybe a second wave or a surge in cases. Those are France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Um, and they are seeing uh, surges more reminiscent of what they saw in February. We also see Brazil has 3.8 million cases and they surpassed 120,000 fatalities uh, over the weekend. And India yesterday had a horrible, horrible day um, in terms of the highest um, positive case day. They had 78,761 new cases. That country is testing a million individuals a day. They're administering a million COVID, take, COVID tests. Um, and if we don't think we can do it, India can do it, we can do it. And our case um, volume has dipped partially because of the quantity of cases. Or, or tests that are being run. Um, now, also, I just want to highlight Russia is just under 1 million. They have 995,000 uh, cases. So more than likely uh, today or tomorrow, they will surpass a million. And South Korea, we've been monitoring them. They had that one major outbreak at the Starbucks location. But Seoul, the... the um, main city that's been hit by this. They have closed restaurants. They've taken some really preemptive measures. A lot of folks are working from home. And already the reports are, because it's it's uh, afternoon there now, um, are that morning traffic was uh, cut by a third. And a lot of people are staying at home. Schools are, um, have, some have gone remote, although private schools are still open there. Um, so that's where we're at kind of worldwide. Um, the U.S. here, I just want to highlight a few things. Um, the, the, the quantity of cases in California has kind of stayed the same. So Sunday they posted 6,000 new positive, uh, positive cases and they had 71 fatalities. 
Florida's dipped a little bit. They had just almost 2,600 new cases and uh, 24 fatalities. In Texas, same thing, 38, over 3,890 fatalities. Um, but I do want to note Arizona has now surpassed 200,000. So now we have um, a total of, let's see, two, four, six, seven states over 200,000 positive cases. Some things to note just kind of happening. Um, what they I started to indicate is that a lot of the spread we are seeing in small gatherings. So COVID infections, COVID clusters are, you know, gatherings of 15, 20. And that, you know, it's not just in a bar or restaurant. They're seeing it at friends' houses, birthday parties, weddings are a big example of that. Um, and to the note of the weddings, um, that main wedding I've been highlighting, uh, you know, they continue to increase in terms of uh, that being a super spreading event. Um, that I found out 65 people attended the wedding, <coughs> excuse me, and now there are 123 positive cases from that. Um, and it has expanded out. It's uh, the spread has been, uh, it's moved into a jail, it's moved into, um, I believe, a meatpacking uh, plant. And uh, it has impacted a multitude of local businesses. And that wedding um, surpassed the, the local guidelines of 50 or less. And so that's one of the reasons because of lack of social distancing. Uh, but they, they talk a lot about the social gatherings, you know, especially like football season, people get together, family events, family traveling, you know, reunions and things like that. Um, if they aren't being canceled, they could very well be a point of, of community spread. And it could be simple as a girl slumber party that could pose a threat. And they have they have a lot of examples of isolated cases. Um, I don't, I wasn't able to gather just timing wise where Sturgis is, but I know that that is going to be a super spreading event already as we're seeing. Uh, but I will report more on that particularly. Um, also, I'm not sure if you guys watched, um, but the VMAs were on MTV and the you know, musicians all gather for a award ceremony. Lady Gaga was demonstrating some amazing, very artistic masks, but her message was on point in terms of mask wearing. And she even sang one of the songs, a uh, collaboration she did wearing a mask. So I got to give her props. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is that uh, there's a professor from a university in Pennsylvania who last week hosted his first Zoom session with his class and promptly announced that they should just get COVID now and it'd be better if they got it sooner than later. And he recommended that they go to a bar on campus. Apparently the bar is closed because of uh, COVID and social distancing, but there's a lot of flack for his commentary. It's unclear kind of why he said what he said, but he, um, you know, he recommended that, you know, the sooner they can catch it, the sooner they have immunity and the safer it is for everybody. But that is not proving to be true. So he clearly is not a professor of science or epidemiology or any of the kind of science based uh, factual uh, uh, departments that would have a better inkling and understanding of just the nature of this spread. Um, so you might hear a little bit of that news, but I just thought that was really kind of insane that we have, you know, still folks that would be considered to be intelligent parties that are spewing misinformation. And, um, you know, there's, that, that is a very negligible, uh, and, and highly accountable, um, communication on his part. He's liable for potentially, you know, some students taking him seriously. As a professor, you think everything that comes out of his mouth is going to be true and factual. So I just want to highlight that. Uh, Jenny watched the VMAs. I watched just a little bit, but I just, I love the snapshots of like um, the, the VMA. So I thought that was interesting with Lady Gaga and mask wearing. Um, but I do want to make a note that the University of Illinois is an interesting case study. Um, the students there um, had kind of a competition, if you will, um, and they've created their own lab test. They've created their own COVID test, and they are rolling this out onto their campus. And it is hinged on being able to test students multiple times throughout the week. And what they did is they looked at some of the successful 
uh, organizations like the NFL or, and the NBA of how they are effectively dealing with the spread. And they're also dealing with the mitigation of COVID. And their goal was to um, a test that would be capable of having students be tested weekly. And that is happening right now. So they have rolled it out on campus. Students are getting tested throughout the week and even on the weekends. Uh, there were some notes that a student was kind of upset. He had to stand in line a little bit longer on a Saturday. Um, but the, it is saliva oriented. It's a rapid test. They immediately are able to know their results within you know, a certain period of time during that day. So it's not even like they're waiting. And then they can take measures if they need to quarantine. They also have built an app that communicates any type of contact that students may have had. Um, and this might prove to be a very interesting example of really successful university life, um, combating COVID on campus. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, whereas we're not seeing that so much on, you know, the UNC and the Notre Dame campus and even the University of Alabama, they now have over 1200 cases of COVID um, at the University of Alabama. And I don't even think they posted numbers from Sunday yet. Um, so I'm sure that number has increased a bit. I do want to highlight a new um, kind of a new editorial to that study that I posted um, last week. It was more about the heart-related uh, uh, multi-system inflammatory disease, but pediatricians came out and posted in uh, JAMA specific, not pediatric JAMA, but they um, write a, an editorial article about symptomatic and asymptomatic viral shedding in pediatric patients. Um, and they really dig into the specifics of that one research article that I highlighted about the heart impact. And if you're curious about that, that that's Saturday's video. Um, it was a, a study that came out on Friday, a very specific focused study um, in Korea. Um, what they highlight is that one of the things that was evident and highlighted in the um, article, and I don't know, I don't remember if I highlighted this, but I feel like I want to communicate that again, that kids carry in their nose and throat for weeks, active viral particulates. And so kids can be asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic and carrying the virus and offloading it to others. And they wanted to highlight that, you know, in the U.S. specifically, there's 85% of kids potentially that are missed, um, that, you know, th that, are, that are not being tested for missing uh, the, the viral particulates and the potential asymptomatic silent spread from children. Um, and this is about a strategy on, it, it is a direct response to the CDC reworking their guidelines last week. They're still getting a ton of grief. Um, they're trying to backtrack a little bit. But essentially last Monday, the CDC posted very, very nonchalantly a, a quick little text message or a, a Twitter message saying that they're rolling back uh, requirements for testing. If you are asymptomatic and you haven't had any type of prolonged contact, meaning 25, 30 minutes or more with somebody who might be asymptomatic, that you don't have to get a COVID test. Part of that is because we don't have testing the capacity to test. We also have the desire of a higher, you know, power that wants to see lower testing because supposedly lower testing equals lower spread. It's completely just insane. Um, but what they're saying is that the, the pediatric uh, doctors are raising red alerts. And this particular journal article, I'll post the link to this, three pages, but it looks at, um, the this particular study that came out. So I mean, we we're talking about really quick turnaround, and it published online um, on Friday as well. So they had the details and they 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 put this out there, um, where they look at specifically these infected children and the fact that many of them are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, and that uh, a very part of testing and use of face masks. Um, would be able to target asymptomatic carriers that may serve as what they call an important reservoir that may facilitate silent spread through a community. So their concern was schools returning, kids might not present with symptoms. And so parents might not even know that they are carrying COVID in their nose and their throats. And they carry it in the nose and throat longer than adults do, at least from what we've seen. 
And so their concern is that, um, you know, missing, changing the testing strategy by the CDC um, would mean that we're mi missing individuals who are undetected and not isolated. So that is the gist of this. I thought this was really interesting. And these two uh, physicians, they are out of, um, I want to say they're out of uh, DC. So George Washington University, the School of Medicine, and the Children's National Hospital and Research Institute in DC. So these are two, uh, as well as uh, there is an additional, one, one of the authors is um, a, a, a pediatrician with the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases um, in the Children's National Hospital and Research Institute. So this is fascinating. Um, the other thing that we are seeing is that there, um, the Glax, Glax, Glaxo, I think I'm saying that, Glaxo Smith Klein or Smith Kine, the, um, that pharmaceutical company has collaborated with Vir or Vir, 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 Biotech. Um, and that particular biotech company is the one that's rolling out these antibody testing. Well, they've announced that they are experimenting. Um, they started experimental antibody testing with humans, um, specifically on recently diagnosed COVID patients. So that's a, a newer announcement. They invested big time in that company in April. I think I reported that then, but now they are experimenting uh, the antibody uh, in, infusions with uh, recently diagnosed patients. And that could be the gamut of mild to severe. The other thing that came out, um, just some doctors that have been uh, a pulmonologist specifically had an interview and I listened to it and it was really interesting where she talks about the long haulers um, and they actually have clinically in, I think it's, um, I think out of China, they're calling it long COVID. So longer term, or no, it's not out of China, UK. The British uh, medical providers are calling any individual who has COVID symptoms three weeks or more is called long COVID. So it's a longer disease. And she highlighted that, you know, long COVID is a uh, blood vessel disease. It's a brain illness and it is a muscle illness. And that those three factors, muscle being heart, your lungs, um, and a lot of different muscular related interactions and body functions even stomach as well, um, that they're seeing the impact of that is just so global. And the pulmonologist said that some of her patients have had COVID and, and are experiencing still respiratory grief. One of the um, medical providers was in Utah. And so, you know, Utah is at a higher altitude and they have folks that have the need for oxygen for weeks and months after the first uh, onset of symptoms. And um, she said, you know, it had does the, the role that it, the COVID plays on the lungs has nothing to do with the altitude, but there is that factor that that does contribute. And that is really something I haven't really seen anybody talk about is, you know, some of these areas where, you know, Colorado and other communities are maybe at higher altitude, like, you know, Florida, you're at sea level and other areas that are coastal. But inland, you might have, you know, an elevation of 1200 or 23 or 34, 40, you know, 4200 um, feet above sea level, and that changes and affects the lung capacity. So she was talking about how there's this this global impact on the body, um, and was highlighting that we need to start to call it long COVID. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, but most important and most fascinating to me is this research specifically out of um, Pew. And Pew does a ton of different research. Um, you know, they research all different types of things. But one of the big things that they hone in on is how are people feeling and the psychological impact. Specifically, the study looked at um, what they call uh, psychological distress from COVID related to decision fatigue. And it literally talked about how the, the greater burden of decisions within families um, it tends to be, uh, it, it lies on women. And so it's, you know, kind of look at the disproportionality of decision making. And, it, and they looked at everything. They looked at, you know, are you going to send your child to school? 
you have to make a decision. Do you do in-person? Do you do a hybrid? Do you do virtual only? Do you decide to homeschool? Do you do pod communities? I mean, there's so many decisions in that. Then they looked at, you know, you're going to weigh risks. So there's all these decision-making uh, factors. You know, you have to find out what's going on in your community. Do you go to church? Do you do virtual church online? Do you go shopping? Do you go shopping online? Do you order your groceries? Do you clean your groceries? And it literally <laughs> looked at all these decisions that we are now having to assess every day, every you know morning, every afternoon when it comes to our day-to-day -day lives. And that is plaguing people mentally and psychologically. And it really dug into what they call a hypervigilance um, and that the hypervigilance, you know, maintaining that is challenging. It's also, ex they started to highlight, explains why there's kind of a loosening of people feeling like I've got to get out. I got to go do something. I think we all feel that Brian and I have definitely felt like that. We've probably been more active and engaged being outbound because we've, we're, re we're we kicked off our home remodel. So we've had to go pick out tile and pick it up and get grout and all the other stuff. And it's putting us in a higher risk category um, by being out and about. Um, Christy, oh, you like the earrings. Yay. Thank you. Uh, I've gotten a lot of flack for the earrings. Some people have said, this is a little side note. I had somebody on Instagram say, I lost credibility because of my toilet paper earrings. It's not like I have the other stuff that goes with toilet paper on here. <laughs> I could understand that that would be kind of crazy, but they're just, they're really cute little earrings. They're handmade by women on Etsy. I think I have links down below. I love supporting Etsy local business uh, shops. A lot of them are moms, stay at home moms. And, you know, your small businesses are the backbone of our economy and I'm all over supporting them. And plus, if they give you a laugh, then that is my laughter, happy medicine for you. So, <laughs> um, but at any rate, Pew really looked at stress and this is what they came, the conclusion. A third of Americans are feeling psychological distress from making decisions that way into how safe are they on a daily basis. And, you know, these are things that we might not even contribute or attri not contribute, attribute to factoring into stress. So, you know, they went into like events, you know, if you're at work, you know, you're wearing a mask, do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? When do you wear a mask? You wear a mask in the, um, you know, when you get out of your car and you're at the shopping center, you know, all of these different decisions that we have to make. And it highlighted um, just the degree of stress that it's plaguing and, and, and is placed on people. So let me know, comment in the comment box for all of you watching live because it's live. I love engaging. And also for any of you watching on the replay, if you're feeling this, what they call decision fatigue, where, you know, you just feel like all the time you've got to make decisions and it's something as little as like, do I clean this box that maybe arrived? You know, we have certain delivery folks. I know some people are wearing masks and I know others aren't. And I'm more inclined to clean the items that, you know, are dropped off by a non-mask wearing UPS or Amazon delivery person. So let me know if you're feeling like this. Um, and thanks, Tracy. Futuristic. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Um, yes, Lori, we have been totally busy. And so one of the things that I wanted to highlight are some of my favorite ways of incorporating... Uh, very potent, but very gentle um, natural medicine into your day to day lives. And it comes in the way on form of homeopathy. Home I love homeopathy. I talk a lot about herbs and I've done probably 10 videos in this live sequence since March about stress and herbs and things like that. But I want to talk to you a little bit about homeopathics because homeopathy can be very potent when it comes to this physical and psychological uh, distress that we're all experiencing. And one of the things that we can do is we can target some of the symptoms of stress. So, you know, if you're dealing with agitation, if you're feeling burnout, if you're feeling malaise or physical fatigue, um, you're having kind of anticipatory anxiety, you're having insomnia because of it. And, and I really dig into you know, and a lot of my content to all of you, the rate, the, the role of stress, the stress hormone called cortisol, you can test it. 
So there are ways for you to actually identify how stressed out is your body. And have you gone past the, the stress threshold? Like some people just burn out entirely and now they're not making any stress hormone. And you can have symptoms, the polar symptoms, it could be one of high or very, very low and they're the same kind of symptom. But ultimately, if we can't manage the stress we're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis, it takes a toll in a biochemical way. It affects our hormones. And I have a hormone webinar uh, workshop coming out for all of you. Stay tuned. It's coming out in September um, where we're going to dig into all of the different hormone uh, chemicals and organs and glands involved in the endocrine hormone structure, how all of them are involved and impacted by stress. So, you know, our reproductive male and female hormones, our insulin uh, management, our weight management, our sleep cycle, our mental mood, uh, you know, how well are we feeling? Um, and, and are we able to manage anxiety and depression? Well, are we dealing with the, the world in a healthy way? Or are we just overwhelmed and imbalanced? And there's all these different things that occur. So when we're looking at you're using herbs, I always recommend those. But then another layer of support is to use homeopathy. And one of my favorites is a brand called Genexa. And this, I actually, this goes down to age three. So three years and up and three to 11, take one tab. I have Gabriel taking these because, you know, the reality is that he's stressed out just like we are. He's also absorbing our stress and the anxiety of like, we go to Home Depot and usually he rides on the cart and I'm like sanitizing everything and don't touch anything. <laughs> you know, at four, you're really, they want to touch everything. And we're, we had to go and pick out um, uh, some new appliances for our laundry room. And he's like wanting to touch and open up all of these things. And I'm like, ah, I'm just seeing like the, the germs, you know? So kids are absorbing that. Kids are also dealing with, the same degree, if not more, because their lives are so, uh, so turned upside down too. And they're having to do things like wear masks for eight hours a day if they're in school. So this is called Genexa. I have a link down below. We sell this in my um, full script store. So you automatically get 10% off if you want to buy this, but I want to highlight some of the things that are in here. Um, it has a series of, let's see, two, four, six, seven, or seven homeopathics. And um, some of these are not going to be easily found as individual click packs. And I actually have another one that I'll, I'll show you. Oh, Daisy's coming to say hi. Hi, Daisy. Um, so some of the things that you can address. One homeopathic particularly addresses stress, agitation, and hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity. The other addresses anxiety and sleeplessness. The other, fatigue and restlessness. That's just synonym. Um, irritability and anticipatory anxiety apprehensiveness and an inability to think clearly. So brain fog, if you're kind of experiencing that restless sleep and stress. So if you don't feel like you're getting good sleep um, and then also it has Valeriana, which is a wonderful homeopathic that addresses nervousness and digestive sy symptoms due to stress. Some people will have stress induced IBS or they'll experience like diarrhea or constipation. Most of the time it's diarrhea, like worry, sorry all of the dust from our cleaning um, and organizing our laundry rooms is overwhelming. So I love Genexa. And this is one of those things where you might take two tabs and I'll show you what these tabs look like. The way homeopathy works is very different than your normal kind of herbs or, uh, you know, minerals and things like that. You take a little bit of homeopathy sequentially throughout the day. So like usually the dosing is every three, four or five hours and they're these little tabs and they literally dissolve in your mouth. And homeopathy has a lot of pellets or um, pastels. It has a lot of like dissolvables. A lot of them are going to be transmitted into your body under the tongue. So they're kind of sublingual, if you will. And it allows this slow introduction and what homeopathy does is it triggers your body to react in a way that is very natural in its normal um, reaction, but it'll, it'll challenge the body to recalibrate. And that is why I love to add homeopathy as well as your adaptogenic herbs like Tulsi and holy basil. 
So that Genexa is really good. This covers a lot of the bases because I think most of the time there's an irritability and underlying anxiety. We start to have uh, our, our nervous system and our, our, our sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system start to react. We'll have high blood pressure. We'll start to see, you know, an increase in the heart rate. We'll see even changes in pulse. Um, we can even see changes in just how well somebody feels. Like if you're feeling like your brain's still connected to your body, sometimes lightheadedness can accompany stress and that's the adrenal impact. Homeopathy can calm that down, which is a really good addition to anything that you're doing. The other thing that I love, I've highlighted this particular uh, pellet, and this is um, a, a little click tab. So these are these little pellets. Now we can see them. Let me show you. They're these little white pills. They're really tiny. And you literally put like two or three under your tongue. And you they they're it's it's like a little sugar pill. I've had people ask me, you know, what's the sugar content content? It's like minimal. But they dissolve in your tongue, like right now it's dissolving. It usually dissolves within a few minutes. This particular um, homeopathic is my go-to for what the Pew Research has highlighted. So if a third of you, maybe more of you are experiencing this, um, this type of kind of psychological stress where you're feeling worn out, overwhelmed, this actually, this phosphoricum um, acidum, it addresses... Uh, and relieves when you're overworked or have concentration challenges due to overwork. So it's like mental kind of stress where you're feeling like just brain burnt out. And a lot of that decision making has you're 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 engaging your brain, and it's not something that is uh, where you can just disconnect. So if you're feeling mentally fatigued, you know, brain fog, burnout, this is really good for it. This also is going to treat stress related hair loss. It's one of the pills in it, or the homeopathic. So I actually posted a video two, two Sundays ago um, about hair loss. So if you're experiencing hair, stress-related hair loss, this is a big factor because that burnout, it's going to affect all of the chemicals, all of the neuroendocrine balance, as well as the hormone structure where your body's actually causing, uh, you, you actually have stress to the scalp because of a certain chemical that occurs when we have higher stress levels huge, huge help and huge support. Um, the link down below, I'll include links on Instagram or, um, after this where you can grab this, but phosphoricum acidum. Uh, Lori says, I forgot I have the adrenal drops. Would they work well? Yes. Yes. Adrenal, all adrenal support. Adrenal glands are your stress response, your fight or flight. Um, and your fight or flight uh, system is greatly exacerbated and on red alert during COVID. So the fact that we have a virus that is new, we have a virus that is killing people, and depending on where you're at in time, in terms of your underlying health conditions and concern about your own safety and concern about your family members or loved ones, it, it just really increases that stress burden. And that's where we see a lot of the mental uh, fatigue kind of play in. So those are two, the Genexa, um, and then this phosphoricum acidum, love these. Now, and I have links down below for these. These you can grab in full script. Also, the other thing that I recommend, and this kind of falls in not so much homeopathy, but it is flower essence. So very similar to homeopathic in terms of how it works. But most importantly, flower remedies uh, were discovered by a doctor who uh, specifically was working in a psychiatric ward and would take patients out into the garden. And he noticed that as he would, you know, put them in front of a certain, you know, pine tree or birch or a flower, that they start to have positive changes in their emotional state. So that ensued a whole bunch of research. It's very fascinating. I'm a certified Bach therapy um, or a, a Bach remedy or Bach therapist, Bach flower therapist. And so I've studied all of this, I've studied all the different flowers. And they actually have the, they have a spray, they've got this, these pastels, but it is a therapy that they combine five specific flower remedies. Rock Rose, Star of Bethlehem is one, Clematis, I actually grew up, grow Clematis here, and Patience and Cherry Plum. Those five have been um, deemed the, the most if, impactful and effective at, at managing and targeting stress.
Yes. And I have been a consumer for gosh, almost 20 years now from the get go. Like I came upon Bach flowers when I was burnt out from my uh, Epstein bar situation. And um, I consider it, I call it my Teflon. Like if you're really dealing with a lot of stress and depending on how you handle it, um, this allows you just to kind of have a, a way of dealing with it where you're not reacting and you're just taking and doing what you need to do. You take it in, you're like, okay. And it just allows that the stress to bounce off you in a way where you're not absorbing the stress and then you're not seeing those chemical changes. So I, I can't, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you about the Bach flowers. They have individual flowers, but the, the true power punch is their rescue remedy. That's the one that has the five flower combo. Um, I will independently use Star Bethlehem and Rock Rose for PTSD. Um, I worked, did a lot of work with the military um, in the Tampa region. We had uh, McDill, which is the CENTCOM center. So I have a lot of um, soldiers returning that were in the area or just happened to be on base and, you know, for a time period. And they would come in and they'd be dealing with serious PTSD and, you know, would still be on active duty. So they couldn't do some of the pharmaceuticals. So they had to look at other options. And I, I would always be in my work with these flowers. And we've been able to take some of them off of, you know, the, the, the degree of suicidal thoughts. It can target deep, deep depression. Um, it's very potent. And it, it, both with homeopathy and the Bach flowers, if it's going to work, it's going to work almost immediately. Like, you know, as I take um, these and I, I, I've got like five or six of these on, on tap. Like this is something I'm taking this phosphoricum acidum. I take it all the time. Um, I notice a big difference when I'm taking them and when I'm not just in terms of how, how am I dealing with life? <laughs> and, and there's a lot of stress. Um, so very, very potent. And I see Tracy loves Bach. Um, Mango Mia will hair grow back after stress goes away. It depends on the degree of stress, depends on your hormones. Um, but yes, you should see as long as there's no sort of long-term damage to that hair follicle, um, where it's been stunted or stopped from regrowing, um, a lot of times we'll see the hair, hair grow back, but you have to invest in balancing all these different aspects of hormones to achieve that fully. Um, Oh, good. Jenny B says, good morning, everyone. I've been taking my adrenal drops and spray my Bach flower remedies every day with my vitamins. I've been feeling great. Yes. I love it. Yeah. Uh, Bach rescue spray. Pat keeps it in her purse. I love this stuff. I've got them in my car. Gabriel loves these and these are good for kids too. They have a kid's dropper version. Uh, that's an alcohol free. They have alcohol free as well for your, for adults, but I kill suck on these. So, you know, I definitely think it's something if you have children, definitely don't neglect their stress management. Um, but it, it for sure, I wanted to present um, some ways for you to deal with this really overwhelmingly situation. A third of America, that's a lot of people um, are, are notating psychological distress. So there are symptoms that they have already been um addressing and dealing with. And it's so noticeable that they've categorized that themselves. Um, and it becomes really critical. We take care of ourselves. So it's important every day that you, especially if the decisions are like, if they're resting on your shoulders and you're, you know, female in your family, this study highlights the disparities between men and women. But even my men, you guys need to also be supporting your stress levels. And so for ladies, if you're a gentleman uh, in your lives, you know, uh, partners or sons um, and even parents, we need to make sure everybody is managing stress in a healthy way because there is a thing that occurs where we deal with stress in a human way where we're just in, we're in it. And so our body starts to shut down certain sy systems um, or starts it changes and alters the way our body is um, being is alive. It, let's see, how do I describe this? I'm sorry, I'm having Mondays. <laughs> um, it, the way our body deals with stress is it changes the biochemistry. And that biochemistry ch is changed so that we can survive the episode. 
It doesn't matter if we were cavemen and cave women being chased by a saber tooth tiger, or we were dealing with feast, you know, a, a famine situation, or currently we're dealing with, you know, all these things of being at home, trying to manage and balance work. We're trying to deal with, you know, our lives and, and, you know, uh, financially we're dealing with the, you know, social aspects with our kids. There's a lot we're all juggling and all of that, um, the body doesn't know the difference. The hard wiring for the human body is no different than the hard wiring was in caveman, cave woman time, uh, cave women times. And that hard wiring is something we can't escape. So we have to realize that this hard wiring right now, we are in a stress state and the aftermath of stress is where the bad stuff happens. That's where we see weight gain even more than sometimes that stressful time. Like we'll have, we'll put on a little pound, you know, poundage, like in the tummy, the abs, you know, the abdomen, the flanks, the butt, the thighs, that's all stress related um, protection of our core organs. But then after we will have a metabolic change, like there, there is a metabolic change in terms of how do we process carbohydrates and function efficiently as humans. We see changes long-term to our heart health and changes to our reproductive system. So that all gets triggered during this time of stress. So if we don't deal with this current time, there's a wave of stress-related uh, side effects. And so that's what I'm trying to help all of you deal with is the current state so that when we finally get back to you know, um, AC after coronavirus normalcy, which will be not normal, but it'll be a new normal. Um, that will be something that you're not going to be noticing just the overwhelm of stress. And usually it's three to five months after a stressful event or situation that then you start to see the effects. And it's almost like you're drowning at that point. And so I wanna make sure all of you get through this. This is like a life fest. So think about like your stress management, homeopathics, your you know, the herbal teas where you're drinking your Tulsi and holy basil tea and your or, or, um, holy basil and rhodiola tea and you're doing all your stress management and, uh, you know, adaptogenic herbs and adrenal supportives that I've recommended. That all gets you through current and then there's going to be other things that we're going to need to do. Okay, so, oh no, Christine says her son's dog died yesterday. It's very emotional about it. And so today I feel totally worn out. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Um, and, and that being worn out, is just an indi indicator that your, your tank was already close to empty and you need to refill. And so Christine, I would definitely do a lot of supportive stress management tips. And I'm so sorry. I hate it when pups and animals pass. Um, okay. So and Nancy, yes. So they do make Bach for, for animals, pets. Um, like we had a big thunderstorm last night roll through. And the dogs get all freaked out. So we will use Bach on them. Um, groomers, a lot of groomers will give, they've got Bach on hand, Bach flower. They have it for dogs uh, that deal with the anxiety and stress. And it is, animals really respond well to both herbs and homeopathics. Uh, a friend of mine from Tampa, she's a, an acupuncturist uh, on all types of animals. She's done her fellowships on black rhinos and you know, done work in Thailand. Um, but she also does acupuncture on, on dogs and cats and um, horses as well. Um, and they respond really well. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, how is Mina? Oh, yes. Yeah. So our puppy, uh, she's doing okay. We haven't, we've been really trying to refrain her, you know, keep her from playing our my flat coat, Mina. Mina, we'll see if she comes in here. She's very skeptical. We took her to the vet. She's like, uh, no, let's see if she comes in. Come here. Hi, Daisy. You want to say hi? Come here, Mina. Come here, pup. So Daisy and Mina are friends. Here comes Mina. Come here, pup. Hi, sweet girl. Here she is. I know. Hi, Daisy. Hi. I know, Daisy. So Daisy and Mina are super friends. And um, hi, thanks, Daisy. Uh, Mina is a retriever. Like she will. Come here, Mina. She goes after the ball. That's like her thing to do. And so. Daisy is usually her, her partner in crime and they'll run after the ball, but Daisy has not been chasing the ball because we've restricted Nina from that. So apparently Daisy only does that, only catches the ball when she's playing with her friend. So, but Mina's doing okay. She's on an anti-inflammatory and we've been giving her some special stuff. Come here, Mina. Come here, puppy. She's so beautiful. All of our dogs are rescues. Come here, my sweet girl. 
Um, but she had a, um, they think she had a sprained uh, ankle. And so getting a retriever, not to retrieve her ball. We've had to text our neighbors and let them know that Mina can't go chasing the ball because she, we have seven yards that our fence touches seven neighbors. And so she's made friends with all of them and she'll jump up on the fence and um, she'll jump up on the fence and, and drop the ball or give them the ball and have them throw it to her. And so we had to tell all of our friends, but one of our neighbors buys her all sorts of like dried liver treats. And so she's like, but she could still get treats. Uh, so we appreciate Claire, one of our, our awesome neighbors. Uh, let's see. Oh, a little scout. Um, okay. So yeah. So Mina's chillaxing. It's, it's rained here a few days. So that's been helpful and just kind of keeping them uh, from going out and running. But um, and we had a tragedy with the deer friend. Um, so we have a lot of deer in our area and, um, the deer, like the dogs, this one particular deer, she's introduced her babies to the dogs. And, uh, we got reports a week ago, the mother was uh, hit right in front of our neighborhood. And, um, she had, I think two or three, uh, babies. And so they've taken them to the nature center and are going to help rehab the, or at least, you know, raise the deer. So they're not chasing the deer right now um, because they're kind of staying away because of that event. But usually we have a deer eating my roses and our, our garden, but um, that's helped also. So that means it's not chasing because she will run and then Daisy tries to jump the fence, right? So she's loving her little massage. Okay. Um, Let's see. Thank you, everyone. I know it's not good to get so emotional. You know what, Christine it is okay. So if you feel like you have to refrain from holding, you know, releasing your emotions, what happens is when we stuff our emotions, we actually have that um, stay in our body. And so you want to release all of those emotions, you know, anger, sadness, grief, um, and lymphatically, uh, your lymphatic system is a representation of your emotions. And like the tears and, and the fluid levels, um, a lot, of, I work a lot with the emotions of how are we dealing with stress? How are we, hey Daisy, you're pushing me all over. Um, how are we dealing with that? Because we do see the impact of, of um, you know, refraining from carrying through all of those emotions. Here, 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 I want to sit in my lap. Um, so definitely do, you know, release, recognize, acknowledge, release. Um, and, you know, grief is a normal emotion and it has its processes. So, you know, don't beat yourself up, uh, any of you, Christine, particularly about how you're feeling, you know, validate those feelings and it's totally okay. All right. So, and by the way, we're working with Gabriel and emotions. There's a really good, um, um, like small business that has all of these kind of uh, ways for kids to get in touch with their emotions. Um, and I'm feeling like that's really good also for us adults where, you know, we're dealing with a lot where a lot, a lot of us are grieving changes. Uh, you know, some of our favorite businesses are shuttering or changing their process. And um, it's just this, the situation is affecting everybody in so many different ways. Okay. So any other questions? Um, I know. Hi, puppy. You're, you're my good girl. Oh, and she's, she has something right here. So we're going to have to take her. You think she scratched her chin on the fence or something, but so we're gonna have to take Daisy to the vet at some point this week. Um, what is the number for homeopathic? It is 30 C 30 C. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Daisy is Daisy is like, she, we saw her and fell instantly in love with her. She is a sweetheart of a dog. She's a funny little mix. Um, and Louise Hay. Yes. We love Louise Hay. Um, so definitely um, Lori's telling me to tell Christine about Christine. If you haven't checked out Louise, I do check her out. She's amazing. And she's all about emotions, like how, you know, some emotions manifest in the body. Okay. Get down. Good girl. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, what do those numbers mean? So that means just potency um, for the, uh, dosing. Um, so there's a lot of different ways of like the intricacies of homeopathy. Sometimes we'll do 10 X or hundred C, but 30 C is what, what I have um, and recommend And like three little pellets under your tongue several times a day. If you're feeling like, Oh, I'm really stressed out. You can take this 
You, I mean, with homeopathy, if you're feeling it, take it. Um, and there's, you know, kind of a sequencing, like some of my um, cold related ones, you take every 15 minutes for like two hours, but these would be like every three, four hours, or when you're feeling uh, intense emotions, same with the Bach flowers, Bach, I mean, there's, there's no sort of overdosing on that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Daisy is a, she's part Stratfordshire, we did DNA. She's 20% Stratfordshire Terrier. Uh, 12 or 15% border collie, Shetland sheepdog, some other sheepdog. Um, but the collie is like, she's got the, the collie kind of agility and really, really smart. And she hugs. So she uses, she's a paw. So she'll use her paws and like hug you and, and tap you on the shoulder. <laughs> uh, dogs, they're so great. They totally um, uplift us and we get a lot of joy out of them. Um, and yes, yeah, so Dwayne says, please stress importance of testing, um, as for COVID or stress related testing, cause you, you could do both. Um, but you know, as far as testing specifically, I have, I don't know if I have test kits back there, but you can do saliva based, uh, stress related testing. And that is extremely helpful. Um, and I run those tests all the time. Uh, D3. Yes. Okay. So Dwayne says, stress the importance of D3 testing, check D3 after three months good. I did it. It was 110. Oh, that's good. Um, and then you can taper down. 110 is definitely on the higher side of the optimal, which is good. Um, okay. So friends, I hope this was helpful. Um, I felt really inspired by that Pew research article. I felt like, okay, if a third of America is dealing with that, I'm sure more than a third of my community is also dealing with that. So I hope that you find impactful. Also, um, I will monitor YouTube. I've got a um, specific, um, blog article that's coming out today. So we're posting more blog articles to our website. So look for that. I'll post that as soon as that goes live. And, um, Pat says dogs don't care what you look like or what you're wearing or your income. They just love you. Total, total unconditional love. Um, okay. So Mina, yes. So Mina actually, Mina is what we call a flat coated retriever. Um, DNA, her background is German Shepherd bred with um, a, oh, what is it called? It's some a Springer Spaniel, I think is the name of it. Some sort of dog, a bird dog. Um, that's why she's super fluffy. She looked like a Newfoundland. I thought I was adopting a Newfoundland because they didn't know what her breed was. <laughs> I thought she'll be like really calm, chill, because my other dog, Mizuki, is really chill. Mina was a terror. She was crazy. She broke a crate. She'd bend the metal bars like outward. Uh, I had her three feet away from my bed and I used to have a feather like comforter, like one of those like really soft comforter things with feathers inside. And I came home and she had pulled it in and there were feathers everywhere. It was like a feather bomb. She was such a naughty little puppy. Um, and she'd do zoomies, like just zooming around. She'd like blow through and zoom through like shrubs. <laughs> she was crazy. And Brian hated her when he met her, but she's now Brian's dog. Go figure. Um, so uh, four kinds of shepherds. Yeah, the shepherd, I'd want to, if I did a shepherd again, or I got a shepherd, I'd want it. I want a white one and I want a male. Males love the female owners where all the girls love the men. So um, yeah, I, Brian's like one over all my dogs. Uh, Newfoundlands. Yeah. Newfoundlands are really great. Mina has a little, one of the reasons we, we thought she was a, a new feet is she has, um, and flat coats are, have this, they, she's got a little separation where Newfoundlands would, would, um, would, would, uh, bring boats in. Like they, they could bring in, they'd latch onto like the, whatever the rope is and they, they, um, uh, swim in some boats. Um, so, and she's, she's a swimmer. She's, she doesn't have web feet, but she definitely is. She swims all the time. Well, not anymore, but we used to take her to the beach every Sunday. We'd take her to the dog beach. Uh, so zoomies. Yeah. Zoomies are crazy. All right, friends. You know, I love talking about my pups. <laughs> so, and Gabriel says he wants a, uh, a hamster. His birthday is coming up uh, September. So we're going to be trying to figure out how to celebrate a fifth birthday 
in COVID style. So he has all these requests. He wants a bounce house, <laughs> all these other things. So anyway, hope you guys have a great last day of August. Tomorrow is going to be September 1st and we'll dig into more news. And I hope you guys have a fantastic day. It was great spending the morning with you. I'm grateful for all of you tuning in. Please give this a thumbs up, comment on the video when it wraps, and I will add um, links and all that good stuff to Instagram. And thanks everybody. Tune in tomorrow. See you then. Bye.